Nice. What's up, everybody? This is Jube from Section 122 on ArgosEndZone.com, getting ready for your, wait for it, home playoff action. That's right. Toronto Argonauts hosting the East semifinal against the crossover challenger of the Edmonton Eskimos. Before we get into the playoffs, let's have a quick chat here about how the regular season finished up. Argos finished 9-9, nine and nine, which a lot of people would say is a, a hair of a disappointment. Like we're still talking playoffs for the first time in a couple of years. But with the firepower, the offseason off -season moves they made, they're expecting to do better. They're expecting to be higher. But let's not nitpick. They're in the playoffs, and anything can happen in the playoffs, especially we're talking about a single-game playoff. Don't forget, the Argos only need to win two games, their next two games, to be in the Grey Cup. How exciting is that? Especially with Toronto hosting the Grey Cup. So, uh, the, let's start with the lowlights. Let's start bad, then finish hot, all right? Uh, lowlights for the season, at least for myself, has got to be the whole Corey Boyd situation. The man is leading the league in rushing, and the Argos flat out release him. They cut him during their bye week. So it's not, not a trade where they're getting something back for him. They just cut him loose. Now, if you want to call it addition to subtraction, that's fine. Feel free to go back and check the article that I wrote about that on ArgosEndZone.com uh, called titled Corey Boyd Out of the Blue. And there was also a big enough kerfuffle about it that the president of the club sent out a letter to all the, the season ticket holders to explain the organization's move for it. Uh, to me, the letter didn't ring true. But again, go to ArgosEnzo.com, read all about that there, so we don't have to re rehashing it then. Injuries were an issue this year, as key players were dropped, were in and out of the lineup throughout most of the season. Uh, Andre Dury, who was consistent all the way through, had injury problems that kept him out of a couple games. Ricky Ray, who played, I think, had a fantastic first season for the Scholars missed several games in a key point of the season that cost them, for frankly, probably cost them a couple wins. But he's back 100% healthy. Jury's playing well. Um, penalties. Penalties. The Argos were penalized quite a bit. I, they may be the most penalized team in the league again. My apologies. I should have looked it up before I started going here. Uh, but they did have some penalty issues and uh, some disciplinary issues. Uh, Brandon Isaac was suspended for the last game of the regular season. I'll get to that a little bit later. But how about the upside? There were some good slots. Uh, there was good sides on all sides of the of the field here: offense, defense, and special teams. Defensive side. Let's talk about Pat Watkins, who has made I think a huge impact on his very first season here in, with the Toronto Argos. Everybody knows what a huge Byron Parker fan I am, still am, always was, and and always will be. So devastated to see him leave for the BC Lions in the off season. But Pat Watkins has played fantastic coming out of the corner. And I can't help but think how amazing it would have been to have him on one and Parker on the other. Let's not get into that. Because, quite frankly, Ahmad Carroll coming old, coming in from the NFL has played very well. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Brandon Isaac, as I said, I think he's made a huge impact, if you'll pardon the pun, on, his, on the opposing players there uh, to the point that he had disciplinary issues three times this season complete with a one-game suspension. When you're talking about an outside rusher can come clean like that, with that type of closing speed, it... Sometimes situations present themselves like they have. Uh, this past week on Off the Record, Brandon Isaac was asked flat out, if you have a clear shot at the quarterback, does that play a role in, in how you approach it? And his response was that, I guess I'll just have to go a little bit lower. That'll work, though, just fine. So I think what you're going to see is him exploding through some people rather than just going up high for those highlight reel hits. Bad news for opposing quarterbacks. Uh, I think that Jordan Younger who played a fantastic season, contributed uh, in great ways on the field, and I'm sure was a leader off the field, in my opinion, got totally hosed on the East All-Star list. Should have been the safety on All-Star. I said my piece. I'm not going to harp on this anymore. On the offensive side, everybody got to talk. There's two key things you got to talk about on the plus side. Now it's got to be, Ricky Ray's contribution as he was one of the league's leaders in completion percentage. Still throws a sweet deep ball. So when you got some of the receivers that the Argos have done, he's been able to spread the field very well with great touch. It's been exciting to watch him, and I've never felt that the Argos are out of any game that I've been, I've been able to watch this year that he was in. And, of course, Chad Owens. Ladies and gentlemen, the Flying Hawaiian was successful in breaking the record for total yardage in a single season held by fellow Argonaut legend Michael Pinball Clements, who saw me on Front Street when we were leaving. Trust me, ArgosEndZone.com. Check out the letter. It, was, it made my week. I've been smiling. It's nuts. Um, but Owens, 
amazing performance. So much, so much excitement. It took on a huge role in the offense. Uh, that one of the first players, or it's been so long since a player has led the league in receiving yards and return yards. Uh, just a huge, huge impact. Congratulations to Fionn, who was also the East candidate for Outstanding Player of the Year. You guys, you got to check out that awards presentation. This could be a big, big one that's coming up for the Grey Cup Week in Toronto. Special teams, it was a bit of a change in the guard. Uh, as Noel Prefontaine went down early with an injury, they brought in Swayze Waters to do the kicking duties. Uh, powerful leg, a little bit of accuracy issues, but came down clutch against the Cats there in the last game of the regular season. And Pre came back. He's still one of the best punters and far and away the most physical punter that's ever lived. So he's going to be a huge contribution to the Argos, both with his experience and his ability on the field going into the playoffs. So when we're talking playoffs, we're talking about the Edmund Eskimos. Uh, head-to-head, Eskimos won both matches, both matchups against Toronto. Uh, opening weekend in Edmonton, which was, I think, a three- or four-point differential, and then a lopsided win in Toronto. So the keys for some strong points for Edmonton has got to be the fact that uh, Fred Stamps is playing very, very well right now. He's where he should have been all season long, and they finally got to get in the ball to him early and often. He is still a dangerous, dangerous man on the f- on the football field, so the Argos have got to be aware of him. Uh, Terry Joseph has been given the ball as the starter for Edmonton. There's a bit of a quarterback controversy coming out of the Eskimos camp. We'll see how long Elise Joseph has got uh, in this, this go-around. And you got the three-headed beast at running back. They, as of this recording, they hadn't announced which two running backs we're going to be part of the, this playoff game. But you've got, you've got Chiefs, Messam, and Corey Boyd, the returning Corey Boyd. So we'll see which combination comes out there. Uh, the Argos have got to be able to stop the run and force Joseph to throw the ball. It's That's all there is to it. Uh, Eminem's defense is led by J.C. Sherrod, the linebacker, who, speaking of record breakers, set the record for most tackles in a single season. The guy is just a machine. Sideline to sideline speed and just a total ball hawk. So the Argos got to be aware of that. I don't know if the running game for Toronto is going to be that effective tomorrow, just because you're talking about a very strong, aggressive defense on Edmonton's side. The front seven puts a lot of pressure out there. Maybe you can get a little bit of misdirection happening, whether it be bubble screens, reverses, or some of the counter. Try to take advantage of that of that aggressiveness. But I'm no offensive coordinator, so it's not really going to be my call. Uh, so, yeah, I think that uh, Toronto is going to have to stretch the field with the, with the passing game. Uh, media, even long passes, because... Ricky Ray is not afraid to throw that deep ball. It's got great touch on it. So it could be a lot of fun on that side. And on the defensive side, uh, it's this, almost the same situation where they, I think they've got to make Kerry Joseph beat them. They can't let the running game run up those yards on the way Winnipeg did a couple weeks ago. They have got to stop the run and force Edmonton to throw the ball. Just a personal opinion. We'll see how it goes. So I think your impact players for Toronto this week are going to be on defense. I, mean, I just I can't shake that Brandon Isaac is going to make a big play in the Edmonton backfield. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be the quarterback or the running back, but he's going to hit somebody. He's going to hit somebody hard. He's going to hit somebody clean, but it's going to be hard. It's going to be fast, and it may just cause the ball to come loose. Just Like I said, it's just kind of coming out of the blue here. Uh, special teams, there's two guys on special teams I'm thinking they're going to make an impact, literally and figuratively. Uh, I think Noel Prefontaine is going to have some, like a, he's going to have a couple really sweet position corner, top and corner punts, pinning Edmonton deep. And that guy is the most physical punter I've ever seen in my life. So it wouldn't surprise me to put a good pop on somebody, too. And speaking of a big pop, Jason Pottinger played a fantastic game against Hamilton. And I'm expecting him to contribute again on the special team side of things. I can't shake the feeling he's going to make a huge impact on that side of the ball. On the offensive side, of course, you got your key guys. Like I said, you've got Ray, and you've got Owens, you've got Andre Dury. Those guys have been contributing all, week, all season long. But there's a part of me that's thinking that if the Edmonton Eskimos are keying on those receivers, watch for a guy like Spencer Watt or Mike Bradwell to contribute in a, in a more surprising way this year. Just, just throwing it out there, but I can't shake the feeling that with great flow comes great responsibility, and I think Bradwell is stepping up into that responsible role this week. We'll see how it goes. But I just when we're talking about the Argos playoff here, if I haven't already mentioned it, this, I don't agree with Steve Simmons uh, almost ever. Uh, the sports writer for the Toronto Sun uh, wrote an article this week saying that this you could see history throughout this game here, as this is the first we got a chance of seeing the first 
Toronto Pro Sports playoff home win since the Toronto Raptors. Really? The Raptors? In, was it 2003? Like just this huge stretch of the, the Leafs not making the playoffs and the Jays not making the playoffs. The Argos' last home game was 2007, which they lost to the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. So if the Argos can win this, it would be the first time that the pro sports team in Toronto has won a playoff game since early 2000, early turn of the century. Before the comments start going, you guys know I love lacrosse. It's one of the first games I ever played. So in all fairness to Toronto Rock, who have far and away been the most successful pro sport franchise in Toronto in the last decade, check the numbers, a lot of NLL wins happening there. They're talking about the so-called Big Four of football, hockey, baseball, basketball. So it's not me. Uh, trust me, I am a huge lacrosse fan, so it's not me picking on lacrosse. But this it's still going to be something very interesting in terms of being a nationwide covered sport. This, this could really, really be something. So, what are you going to do on Sunday? What I would suggest you do on Sunday? Get up bright and early, put on your Sunday best. Show some respect for those that came before us at a Remembrance Day ceremony, wherever it may be, lest we forget. Ladies and gentlemen, this is such a small token that means so very, very much. Thank a veteran. Thank him every day you see them. In particular, make note of it on Sunday. Once you're, when the ceremony is done, you know what? Bring a veteran to the game. How great would that be? Argos game kick off 1 o'clock down at the Rogers Center. This is still going to be right where it is right now for that game. Because you, I can't stress enough how important this is. Guys, there was a conversation on Twitter I had the other day where someone said that it shouldn't be mandatory to wear them. And I agree, it shouldn't be mandatory. This should be 100% choice. But i got to tell you, if you don't make this choice, I'm not looking on you very fondly. I'm off the pulpit here. So, I'm looking forward to an exciting, exciting game. And, of course, I'm picking the Eskimos. I'm not going to pick a score. I just want to see the double blue move on and head into Montreal for the East Final. So, this is Jube from Section 122 here on ArgosEndZone.com. And it, you know how we play it. We ride the rail. We ride it hard.